as the children exit and uh, prepare for the annual nativity play, um, in thinking about such holiday productions, columnist Dave Barry offers the following reflection. He writes, my most vivid childhood memory of Christmas that does not involve opening presents, putting batteries in presents, playing with presents, and destroying presents before sundown is the annual nativity pageant at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church in Armonk, New York. Mrs. Elson was the director, and she would tell the children what role they should play based on their artistic abilities. For example, if you were short, you got a role as an angel, which involved being part of the heavenly host and gazing with adoration at the Christ child. Shepherd was my favorite role because you got to carry a stick. Uh, plus, you spent most of the pageant waiting back in the closet with a rope that led up to the church bell and about 750,000 bats. Many were the happy rehearsal hours we shepherds spent back there in the dark, whacking each other with our sticks and climbing up the ladder so as to cause bat emission products to rain down upon us. After a couple of years as shepherd, you usually did a stint as a three king. This was not nearly as good a role because you had to lug around the gold, the frankincense, and of course the myrrh, which God forbid you should drop because they were played by valuable antique containers belonging to Mrs. Elson. Nevertheless, being a three king was far better than being Joseph, since Joseph had to hang around with Mary, who was played by a girl. You had to wait backstage with this girl and walk in with this girl. Needless to say, you felt like a total jerk, which was not helped by the fact that the shepherds and the three kings were constantly suggesting that you, you really like this girl. So during the pageant, Joseph tended to maintain the maximum allowable distance from Mary, as though she were carrying some kind of fatal bacterial. Dave Barry's probably right. Mary carrying some kind of fatal bacteria, and Joseph, his life infected with this disease, the worst character in the story to play. What do we learn from this most unsung yet crucial player in the story of our Savior's birth. This is what I'd like to reflect upon for a moment here this morning. Christmas through the eyes of Joseph. Now right off the top it needs to be said that we don't really know a lot about Joseph other than that he was a carpenter from the small town of Nazareth. One author pictures him this way. At first view there was nothing striking about this man. His simple well-worn clothes revealed him to be a man of meager means. He was a person of few words much more apt to show his feelings by arriving at your door with his tool chest to fix that stool, table, or door latch. This man was a doer, not a talker. He was an unassuming person who stood patiently in lines, waiting his turn. All the Bible tells us about Joseph is that he was a good man, a solid citizen that any community, large or small, would be proud to call its own. And although some might not think of Joseph as a man of great faith, he really was. And Matthew picks up the story with the story already in progress. Uh, the custom of the day was for families to arrange the marriages of their children, and often this involved negotiation with the parents while the children had no say uh, whatsoever in whom they married. Joseph's family and Mary's family had apparently arranged for the two of them uh, to, to be united. Uh, being a small town, they no doubt had known each other or seen each other. With the blessing of their families, the marriage had been arranged. They formally were engaged or betrothed to each other. There was a legal bond between them, even though they did not live together, and if for some reason either one wanted to break off the engagement, a legal divorce was required. Traditionally, the, the couple would be engaged for one year, and then they would be married. The whole town would celebrate the marriage of two of its own. The wedding celebration and feast could last uh, from a few days to a whole week. Mary and Joseph were undoubtedly excited about getting married, and as, as marriage was the center of life in those days, the whole goal of life. Joseph probably longed for the day when he could take Mary home as his wife. Again, as one scholar reflects, we can well imagine Joseph inventing carpentry errands that took him by Mary's house. And we can picture Mary making a wide detour with her water jar on the way to the well and walking ever so slowly past Joseph's shop. Joseph must have been the happiest man in all of Nazareth. Mary, a great catch, would soon become his wife. And then one day, of course, everything changed. Mary wanted to speak with Joseph. She told him about the angel visiting her who had told her that she would have a, a child who will be, uh, will be great. We called the son of the most high. Matthew tells us that Joseph was a righteous man, but he was having a hard time believing Mary's story. The news that Mary was with child hit Joseph, you know, like a ton of bricks. One author imagines it this way. 
Quiet Joseph grew dark with hurt and anger, turned from Mary, clenched his fist, and skinned his knuckles as he pounded his bench. Mary dissolved into tears and running from his shop. As she left, she blurted out that she had hoped that at least he would understand, and she was gone. Joseph was left alone to agonize over how he should handle this problem. As he saw it, he had two choices. He could either he could set the date, you know, for the wedding sooner and hope his family and neighbors had lost track of the months, or he could divorce her. Mary was in, in grave danger here. If anyone found out that she was pregnant out of wedlock, she would be stoned to death. Joseph didn't want to see any harm come to her, but he, he didn't think it was right to marry her either. Matthew distills all this inner struggle down to just a single verse, but the inference is clear. Joseph struggled greatly with what to do. Probably all day long in his carpentry shop, he, he wrestled with his dilemma, planing, you know, planing boards down to nothing as, he, as he's going over this in his mind. He probably spent many sleepless nights tossing and turning, pondering Mary's strange news, thinking how best to solve his problem. Finally, he had made a decision. He would quietly divorce her so that no harm would come to her. We don't know whether or not Joseph had told Mary of his decision. It, it seems he felt that this was a sensible thing to do because he had such a hard time just believing her story. Everything had gone horribly wrong for Joseph. All the plans he had for his life, his, his perfect hopes, you know, all, he, all had suddenly dissolved around him. Presented with the most painful, difficult, seemingly impossible situation, he's trying to make the best of it. And this is where the story of jo Jesus Christ begins for Joseph. And let's face it, this is where the story begins for a lot of people. In pain, in struggle, in life going horribly wrong, hopes dissolving, impossible situations we're presented with. This most particularly felt in holiday times when the expectations and the longings most clearly you know, butt heads with reality. Well, into this mess of everything gone wrong, Joseph falls asleep. And in his sleep, God visits him in a dream, a dream that changes everything. What did Joseph discover in this dream, and what do we learn from him for navigating our way through those times when life gets difficult and everything seems to be falling apart around us? A couple of thoughts. First, Joseph discovered that God is near. Obviously, this is the, most, the first basic fact that Joseph learns in his dream, that God is not distant and removed and uncaring, unconcerned about his problem, but rather quite the opposite, that God is very much aware of his predicament and is reaching out to, to help him, particularly to speak to him, to calm and guide him. And I think it's interesting that God speaks to him in a dream. Why in a dream, do you suppose? Well, maybe it's because it was the only time that, that Joseph would listen, right? That is, in the Bible, God speaks to people in many different ways, but a dream is a unique way. In our sleep, we are vulnerable. Our defenses are down. Now, obviously, every dream is not a word from God, but in choosing to speak to Joseph this way, maybe it's saying that this was the only way that God could get through to him. Perhaps God was speaking to him all day long, but Joseph simply couldn't hear because his life was so noisy, you know, so filled with his own thoughts, his own plans, his own worries, his own decisions, his constant activity. In his troubles, Joseph first discovers that God is very near, aware and caring and active, seeking to speak to him, to talk him through this. But he has to be quiet to hear it. He has to learn to expect it, to listen for it, and to believe in it. This, of course, being the first lesson for all of us here, that in our times of trouble, God is very near, caring and active. Most especially, first, seeking to speak to us, right? To calm us down and to guide us through. But we have to be quiet to hear this, to expect it and listen to it and believe it. How are we God-resistant? What noise in our lives is keeping us from hearing the voice of God, never stopping, never praying, never listening? You know, God sends all sorts of angels to speak to us every single day. Sometimes it's in the voice of a loved one or a co-worker or even a complete stranger. Sometimes it's in a word of scripture or, or, or in music or in nature or, or in an image on TV. Often God speaks to us through the voices of children whose blunt clarity cuts right to the point. It's like many years ago when I was serving as pastor of the Church of the Good Shepherd up in Bergenfield, uh, at one point I was going through a real tough time in my ministry. There was all sorts of organizational issues and real financial problems in the church, hundreds of demands, and, and I was totally stressed out. Well, in the midst of this one day as I was walking my then uh, six-year-old daughter, Samantha, home from school, we happened to come upon a dead bird 
The bird was on that little strip of lawn between the sidewalk and the street, and I didn't notice the bird, but Samantha did. Look, Daddy, a, a dead bird, she said. Yeah, very interesting, I replied. Without even looking, I was lost in my thoughts, just wanted to keep moving. After all, I've seen hundreds of dead birds, you know? So Samantha, though, who was always obsessed with anything having to do with nature and animals, she just had to stop. She knelt down and looked closely at the bird, and slightly annoyed, I stopped and stepped back to look with her. We ought to bury it, she said. Oh, great, I thought. There are dead birds everywhere. Why don't we just leave it for some, for some cat's lunch, you know? I'm sorry, I don't have time to do a funeral today, right, you know? But Samantha looked up at me with those soft green eyes of hers, and well, okay, we'll bury it, I said. We went into the house and found a shoebox and went outside and I scooped the bird up and then we carried it to the back corner of the yard, a little wooded area, and I dug a hole and we placed the bird in the hole. Samantha says, what do we do now? I said, well, normally, normally you say a prayer. She said, okay, and we held hands and, and closed our eyes and I took a moment to, to think about what to say, to compose my prayer. After all, I'm, I'm the clergy officiating here, right? But before I could say a word, Samantha launched into a prayer of her own. She said, Dear God, thank you for this bird. It was very pretty. It made the world a better place, but now it's dead, so we give it back to you. Thank you for everything you give us. Amen. I said amen as I'm thinking, that's a pretty darn good prayer, you know? I'm the pro, and she's doing better than what I could come up with, right? And as I knelt down to give Samantha a hug, it suddenly struck me. It's as if I could hear God speaking to me in all of this, saying, Clark, you know, I'm always right nearby, and I am constantly sending you resources to help you, like your young daughter. Relax. And so I did. Lesson number one in times of trouble, God is near. Which leads us into the second thing that Joseph, I think, learns in his dream. Number two, the story is not done. The angel speaks to Joseph, begins by telling him to, not to divorce Mary, but to instead to go ahead and marry her. Basically, he says, you know, what she's telling you is the truth. Truly amazing things are about to happen. Joseph had finally come to the painful decision that a life with Mary was over, that it's done, it's finished. But now he discovers that the story is in fact not done. God has made a way. But getting there requires traveling to a whole new place, a place Joseph never imagined going. He has to give up his plans and his decisions and his way. Is he willing to do this? Are we? You know, I once saw a cartoon that had a picture of a, of a man holding a cat over its litter box. And the man is saying to the cat, Now, Mr. Whiskers, remember, never, 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 ever think outside the box. Right? <laughs> Isn't this the way we all so often are? We decide how things must go, and then we refuse to ever think outside the box. Well, Joseph discovers and teaches us that in life, even when things seem the most hopeless, the story's over. With God, the story is not done, but to get there, we have to be willing to place aside our own plans, our own direction, and let God make something new happen, to think outside the box. Perhaps to go to some place we never planned to be, but ultimately with God to know that it will be a place great, of greater blessing than we've ever imagined. With God, when things go wrong, the story is not done, but we have to be flexible in order to receive this. Let go and move on. When a loved one dies, remember, in Christ, the story is not done. When the diagnosis in the doctor's office is cancer, remember, in Christ, the, the story is not done. When there's a divorce, when you lose your job, when, when there's not enough money to pay the bills, when one of your kids has completely lost their way, when you fail, when you fall on again, remember, lesson number two, in times of trouble, in Christ, the story is not done. All of which brings us to the last thing Joseph learns here, namely, he need only be faithful. In the end, the angel tells Joseph not to be afraid to take Mary as his wife, that what she's telling him is the truth, specifically that the child she is carrying is to become the savior of the whole world. Now that sounds Pretty wild, pretty, pretty hard to believe, obviously, but, but you want to know what the really amazing thing here is? The really amazing thing here is that Joseph buys this. Joseph agrees. He sets off after the dream in place of his reality. 
It's crazy. The great preacher, Peter Gomes, he describes it this way. He says, the miracle of Christmas, dare I say it, is not the virgin birth of the creeds. The miracle to which our attention should be drawn at this holy season is the fact that Joseph believes what he hears and acts upon it. The miracle here is that a very sensible, reasonable, pragmatic, and good man, a man named Joseph, the miracle here is that he acts contrary to the evidence that surrounds him on every side. He sees the evidence, he understands it, he knows its implications, and he acts contrary to it. When he could have cut and run, he stayed and played. And it was an active participation in the great drama of the Incarnation. Joseph is an ordinary guy caught up in an extraordinary story who allows God's movement in his midst to take, to take him center stage. Joseph, an ordinary man, quietly, obediently, courageously followed the commands of God and thereby pointed the way for the rest of us. We are ordinary people, but we too are called by God to participate in the good news story. Basically, in the end, Joseph chose to take the dream of a different reality that God had placed before him and to simply strive to be obedient to that no matter what anything else said. To simply seek to live out his peace in that, in a quiet and unassuming way. And there he discovered the fulfillment of God's saving work in his life and in the world at large. And this is what it means to be a Christian. You know, in the Nativity story, Joseph is the only character who has no spoken lines. He never says a word. Now, I assume he could speak. But in the story, he gets no lines. Yet in a very real way, he speaks for us all, all who choose to live for Christ. People who get no fanfare as we quietly seek to be faithful in our daily lives. To live out the dream of Jesus Christ in a world that so often opposes it. There in our faithfulness to finally discover the fullness of God's salvation. Choosing that, that dream over the present reality. Putting aside the cost, not caring what people say, disregarding the effort in caring for aging parents, in helping out in mission work, in confronting subtle gossip, in supporting a struggling loved one, in, make, in making time each day to pray, in passing up the opportunity to show that we have the upper hand, in standing beside some person who is vulnerable in our society, in modeling ethical behavior in the workplace. In all these ways and so many more. Simply put, the final lesson here is that in times of trouble, we need only be faithful that is, simply seek to live out the dream of Jesus Christ, the different reality he offers to the world, and there, simply seeking to be faithful to this in quiet daily ways, God's salvation meeting us. In closing, a noted Christian author offers the following reflection. She writes, My husband and I had what truly was the perfect marriage. Rarely was there a harsh word between us. We were very close, sharing many interests, most especially a love of the Christmas season. It was our favorite time of year, December, the month we most look forward to. A time of decorating, cookie baking, sending out cards, gathering with family and friends, and most particularly a, a time of gift giving. Such it was for nine blissful years until suddenly, without warning, one warm spring day, my husband died of a massive heart attack and my world collapsed. That first Christmas under the weight of the loss, trying to keep up a good front for the children, but consumed with grief, I was overwhelmed and losing ground fast. Late one evening, I thought about the, the gift that I had wanted to buy my husband that year, and with that, the, my grief just swelled. Unable to sleep, I turned on the TV and to sort of drown out my thoughts, a, a Christmas show, it came upon a midnight clear with Mickey Rooney as a star, came on TV. How ironic, I thought, I'm, I'm watching this at midnight. In it, an old man dies before Christmas and must talk the, the archangel Gabriel into letting him return to earth to fulfill a Christmas promise to his grandson. What he finds is the Christmas spirit has failed New York City, and he, in the end, is on TV challenging New Yorkers to go out, greet your neighbors, and do something nice for each other. It's, it's Christmas. Well, that's when it hit me. It was hokey, but I realized God was speaking to me, saying that he, he had gifted me with something special, gifts only a few knew. First, faith in Christ. Then secondly, the great love of my husband that I had known and still held. And then finally, through my loss, gifts of compassion, mercy, insight, and tenderness. It occurred to me, I had to choose, get bitter or get better. I got up, turned to the Bible, and what the Lord spoke to me was verse after verse of scripture, of, of, of sacrifice, giving, and eternal hope. The perfect hope that is Jesus Christ. As I reflected, I thought about those who, like myself, needed exactly that hope. 
I didn't go to bed that night. Instead, I began to write out dozens of Christmas cards and to bake lots of cookies. That afternoon, I wrote down the name of every person living alone listed in my church phone directory, and we sent out the cards and the cookies. The kids and I then planned a shopping venture where we chose one man living nearby who had no family, and we bought for him as if he were our dad. When Christmas Eve arrived, we snuck to his porch and loaded it down with gifts and candies and an engraved invitation to attend a Christmas feast, starting with breakfast the next morning. When I arrived home, we called him and told him we had set a few things on the porch for him and to please take them indoors. He came over the next morning and had an amazing time. We took our grief and utilized it to the service of others, proclaiming life in Jesus Christ. Suddenly, I wasn't focused on my pain, but possibly on lessening the pain of others, and in doing just that, Christ's healing was with me. Each year since, when I have grieved, because the grief monster does come, I take the gifts of knowledge, compassion, service, and abundance, and I share. Against all odds, I strive to live the world overcoming life and love ushered in the birth of Jesus Christ, and he has met me there with life and love in return. The story of Christmas from Joseph's perspective begins with everything falling apart around him, into which God comes with a dream, a dream that Joseph chose to make his own. Might we do the same? When life goes all wrong, remember, God is near, the story is not done, and you need only be faithful. Let us now continue with worship and in response to God's overwhelming gift to us of his son, offer up our gifts in return. Would the ushers please come forward for the morning offering. 